Coming up on episode 19 of the R Podcast, and begin our coverage of our studio conf on location with two really great interviews talking all about Shiny with Barbara Borges from our studio and welcoming back to the show Dean Natelli. I hope you enjoy these interviews. So I only have one question for you. Are you ready? This is the beginning of a special edition of the Art Podcast in which I am on location in Orlando, Florida for the Art Studio Conf. I still think that's a really cool way they named it, where they named it as if you were referencing a function from the Art Studio package, which they do have an Art Studio API package, so that's not too far off, is it? Um, so I'm recording this um, the day before the training sessions begin. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to attend the shiny uh, shiny training session and then of course I'll be sticking around for the actual conference itself so as you may recall our last episodes were centered around uh, shiny DevCon which took place around this time uh, last year uh, in 2016 and at that time a lot of us didn't really know what to expect we were extremely excited because uh, I have been very um, excited about Shiny. I've been using it a lot at work and I've been intrigued by the development of it. And Shiny DevCon, I think, was the perfect setting in terms of getting a small group of people, but then being able for uh, Joe Chang and the rest of the team to really instill some very important concepts. I still remember reactivity being a huge focus. And while I definitely understand a lot more since before that conference I am admittedly still trying to learn some of the nuances especially on the advanced things that he talked about in his uh, presentations there and so I'm really looking forward to the um, sessions uh, tomorrow and Thursday to see how much uh, Joe is going to build upon what he talked to us about last year and I'm especially intrigued by how I can really master some of the newer features, um, such as, of course, modules. Um, I'm seeing some new things in terms of dynamic UIs. And um, a relatively new feature that just came out is a bookmarkable state of the Shiny app. And a lot I haven't been able to play with that one personally myself, but I'm hearing a lot of excitement around it. Um, so again, I'm given how great it went last year i'm really expecting really good things um from joe's uh joe's uh, training session and then the conference itself it's certainly you you can sense that it's much bigger in scope than what we did last year um and i think mostly that's good i think you know sometimes you lose a little bit by making things bigger i mean the biggest downside is the fact that there are definitely more than a handful of instances where there are two really good talks occurring at the same time and i'm really having a hard time picking and choosing which ones i want to see in these uh what i'll call double booked slots obviously um like last year they are recording all the sessions so it'll be good to get a recap of these um when they release the recordings but at the same time sometimes there's just nothing that beats being there in person but again it's certainly good to have those available. Um, in terms of stuff besides Shiny that I'm looking forward to, um, I've recently begun using you know, the functional programming paradigm that we're seeing as Hadley's laid out in the uh, per package, which I have not mastered by any means yet. I, I, in fact, I have one project where I think I shoehorned it a bit too much and I, like fitting a square peg in a round hole or however that phrase is. And I wrote some code that I think in a, about six months or a year from now, I'm gonna look at it and be like, what in the holy heck was I doing there? 
Um, so I'm really hoping that when I'm, I believe a Charlotte Wickham is going to give a talk about Purr. And then I've also been really um, following uh, Jenny Bryan's uh, tutorials on Purr that she's open sourced and put online, um, which have been really nice to kind of give a breakdown of how we can use it in real examples. And also, I was fortunate enough to get my hard, my print copy of R for Data Science right before my, my time leaving for the conference. So I brought that with me and I was reading some of the earlier chapters, but I was just starting to get into the functional programming side of it. And then, of course, the plane landed, so I haven't had a chance to open it since. Um, but I'm so it, that book, by the way. Obviously, it's been in online form as Hadley and Garrett have been writing it um, for what seems like at least a year, maybe longer for all I know. Um, but there's just something about having that printed copy and the fact that the actual quality of the paper and the fact that the pages just seem more smooth than some of the other O'Reilly books that I have. It's just a really quality product. So I know I kind of sound like a like a advertiser here, but that book is, I think, worth anybody's addition um, to their library. And I'm already seeing people tweet out pictures of like, oh, it's here, I got it today. So I'm just as excited as everyone else to have that. So I think, yeah, some of the talks that we're gonna get at our studio conf are gonna um, you know, reinforce some of those principles. And it'd been a perfect world, I would also be able to attend Hadley's uh, training session on the Tidyverse, but again, had to pick and choose and right now um, just at this current stage in time and the way I'm using um, R at work I've had a much bigger focus on Shiny recently so I feel like I need to really level up my skills even more than what I had last year and it'll be great to you know like I said go through that training again so I'm just kind of recording this in a free-flowing way I'm not looking at a you know set of notes or anything um, but the only other thing I'll mention is that I am planning, knock on wood, so to speak, to have some sit-down interviews with key people at the conference, both those that are speaking as well as, of course, some of the attendees that I've either you know, met from Shiny DevCon last year or maybe some, uh, and also some new attendees. And we've all been kind of sending some messages back and forth on the, um, our, the um, our studio app that has been available for you know all the details at the conference and the thing I'm kind of geeked about right off the bat is we got ourselves a lot of new stickers coming out um, I think there's a sticker about purr there's a sticker about um, I think some other some other packages of course goes out of my mind as I put a mic in front of my face but I've actually been clearing off space on my ThinkPad that I brought with me to to make room for all this new um, sticker goodness so that's going to be fun to put those on um so yeah I'm, I'm excited and again it's it's a slightly different feeling than last year because i can sense it is a bigger scope and i've already had some conversations about it and again i think it's going to be very good it's just slightly different and again that's that we'll just see what happens but i'm gonna close out this segment for now and then in the next uh, segment you'll either hear some interviews or I'll give you my thoughts on the uh, shiny training session. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back everybody. We are on site at our studio conf. We have just finished day one of our training sessions and I've been fortunate enough to be in the shi intermediate shiny session. Head is already spinning on a few things and uh, got some basics in the beginning but I got some more advanced stuff. Um, but I have the privilege of being able to corral one of the uh, teaching assistants for today. Um, also a member of our studio. She is uh, Barbara Borges. Uh, Barbara, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. All right, so I always start these off pretty basic. Um, I always like to know how um, you got started uh, using R. Right, uh, so this, all of these things kind of came together at the same time for me, you know, R and computer science, um, in our studio even. Uh, so I had kind of a weird um, path in college. Um, I was a typical liberal arts student that doesn't know what she wants to do and like is switching majors every semester. 
So at some point, I decided I wanted to do math. Uh, so I actually decided I wanted to do math because I wanted to do physics and math was required. So like I uh, very pretty much against my will forced myself to go to this uh, math class in college. Uh, turns out I actually really liked it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, uh, so I thought, well, maybe I could do some more math. And, and so I thought, statistics. So I got into a statistics course, and, and then because I needed to, for statistics, I needed to do computer science. And so again, kind of against my will, I took a computer science course, and guess what? I loved it. So that, that pattern kept happening. Uh, but the point is basically I started learning computer science and statistics pretty much at the same time. And I started programming in R and in like Python and JavaScript pretty much at the same time too. Mm. So I've got a, a pretty unusual background in the sense that, you know, one thing didn't come first for me. They, they both came at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe that's a privileged point of view. Maybe not. It's sometimes I don't know if, if it's a curse or a privilege. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, around, uh, it was pretty late in my college career. Uh, I was in the late second year, uh, the beginning of the uh, third year of the four years at McAllister in uh, St. Paul that um, I started, I took a class with Danny Kaplan. Uh, you oh, probably, yes. yeah. Very so big name, yeah. I, I, my first stats class was with Danny Kaplan. It was a very fortunate a turn of events, as it turns out. Sure, right. Uh, and and he's crazy about R in our studio, of course. So I I got kind of uh, infected with all that excitement, and um, and I started doing some R coding, not even programming at that point. We're just doing linear models and stuff like that. And then I really got into it, and so I would talk to him and uh, at then later, the, at the end of my third year, I actually got to work with him uh, during the summer and building Shiny Apps. That's the first time I actually encountered Shiny Apps. Well, how interesting. Cool. Yes. Uh, so I was building Shiny Apps for like statistics, uh, visualization of statistic concepts and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I was blown away by Shiny. I absolutely loved it. Um, and so, and so, yeah. So, th so that as kind of, I've had a very good, uh, the very good fortune of those things being really there for me. As soon as I put my foot in the door of statistics and computer science and R, all of a sudden, you know, I know Danny Kaplan, I know our studio, I know Shine. It's like one great thing after another. So, yeah. Um, I think I, I kind of got fast tracked into those. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's working out pretty well. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So yeah, you mentioned that you're kind of learning these different languages at the same time from the CS side and mm -hmm. of course from the stat side with R. I'm actually think that may have been a good thing that you didn't start with something first and then R only because I do hear a lot of stories about people coming from say Python or, or C++ and they're like, what is this R thing? It's doing so <laughs> many crazy things yeah. that violate so many principles in CS land. But, and I started with Java. Um, which, which is, which, yeah, ugh, completely different. <laughs> completely different and it was not a good experience and it kind of turned me off a program but then I got into more R stuff and I got, got back into it. Yeah. So, so I think it sounds like the path's been very well for you. Um, so, um, let me see my next question. So, so you mentioned you obviously you're part of our studio now, and that looks like the work that you were doing with Shiny early mm -hmm. on helped you get there. Um, so, what's your current role of our studio right now? So, I'm in the Shiny team, which used to be just Joe and Winston, and now it's Joe, Winston, and me. So, it's still pretty small, and I still think we. Uh, have more to do than we have time to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's been great. You know, they're both brilliant, and I get to learn a lot. Um, and and it's really exciting because even though Shiny is kind of an established product by now, and it's been around for a while, and obviously there's a lot of people that use it, we're still like every release, we still have like this major thing that is coming out, and it's really interesting. And like, you know. As someone who gets like FaceTime with Joe Ching and Winston Chang, like I get to uh, really explore things that otherwise I couldn't. So, you know, if I get an idea by talking to people or just something that I thought it would be cool to try this, I could just say, well, maybe it'd be cool to try this. And, you know, we try it and see see if it actually is a good idea or not. If it is, you know, we continue ahead, we get some user feedback. So, a lot of the things that I've actually been working on kind of came because, like, oh, this looks like a good idea. Let's see what mm -hmm. we can do with that. So that's kind of the origin for pool, the origin for insert UI, sure. uh, the pseudo navigation that Joe mentioned uh, oh, right, at, the, right. at the end. It's just like all things are, you know, maybe it was an issue on GitHub. Maybe it was conversations with someone, mm -hmm. something like that. And it's just like, oh, maybe I could take a stab at this. And yeah. so it's been, it's been pretty great. Um, 
I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, that, that's, that's very helpful. Yeah, because I've been reading your articles about Insert UI. You're going to be talking about that later at mm -hmm. the conference too. So I feel like there's a lot of nuggets here that are either new or maybe people didn't know about mm -hmm. as much. And um, um, that kind of leads into my next question. Obviously, we've been through day one in the training. And we've seen that all the students here, we come from varying backgrounds. Some of us have been using ever since it came out. Others are new to it. Um, what have been, in your side, from your opinion, some of the challenges in helping people take their shiny skills to like the next level from, say, just finishing, say, a tutorial and getting their feet wet to getting to creating, you know, pretty robust apps that can be maintained pretty easily but do some pretty yeah. interesting stuff? <sighs> Such a huge question. I know. I didn't uh, make it easy. No, you didn't. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm gonna try to say some things and I hope they make sense. Uh, I think by far the hardest thing for people, or at least the most common mistake, is uh, they make things complex too fast. Uh, so, you know, you build a, a simple shiny app and it works great, great. So then you just keep repeating that pattern over and over again. And it, all of a sudden you've got 2,000 lines of code and you have no idea how to debug that. <laughs> and things are nested in very weird ways. Um, and so I, I, I think at least that's the first uh, or the most common mistake that people make is, you know, this works, so I'll just continue doing it and then you've got this mess. And one of the worst things of that is, that, you know, like, so Joe reiterated today a lot about uh, doing reactivity well, right? Uh, and, and you can do things in, shi in shiny apps that don't follow reactivity and oftentimes that still works, but it's really not scalable. Mm -hmm. And the problem is if you do a small app, and you know you're not using reactivity well, but it works. Then you you might be uh, you might get into the mistaken uh, opinion that you can just continue doing that. And when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to continue sure. working. Sure. While in fact, it's just going to start failing more and more. Right. And and then you you've dug yourself uh, you've got into this rabbit hole that you cannot really dug your your uh, way out of. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, you'd have to like write your app from scratch. Um, so that, and that's really unfortunate, right? Because you've put all of this work into it right, uh, and, right. and now you've got to redo it in a completely new paradigm. So uh, for, you know, as boring as it sounds to like really start with the basics and really with small apps and make sure you got reactivity, right? I do think that's mm -hmm. an important thing because at least if you think you're going to build complex apps, you really want to make sure you're building it with the right building blocks rather than with just something that happens to work, but it's not really scalable. Yeah. So that would be my first advice is okay. understand reactivity. Make sure you know what's going on. Look at the reactive log that allows you to see the interactions yeah. between the input and the output. Yeah. Make sure you, you understand the model. And once you do that, then yeah, sure. You know, um, do go wild, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So related to that also, and it's something that I know you're interested in and a lot of people are interested in, uh, one way to scale your app without really uh, you know, getting to 2,000 lines of code is modules. Yes, so yes. modules almost work like little apps, right? So if each module works fine, uh, then it's your, your huge app that combines all of those modules is a lot easier to debug and it's a lot easier to understand than if that's all a huge app. Even if you've put them into functions and all of that, uh, that's better than like just um, a huge app that is sequential. Um, so the more uh, the, the more uh, functionality that you can um, encapsulate into a function or into a module or what have you, the better. But I think modules make sense especially make more sense especially for shiny since it does uh make you follow that reactive paradigm that is so important mm -hmm. so i i'd say those those are the the most common mistakes and those would be the uh that the advice i would give is make sure you understand reactivity and you you understand the building blocks well and then w once you scale scale right sure uh, so keep in mind reactivity think if you want to do something with modules Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things, I think, May maybe not the sexiest things in Shiny, but really the things that uh, ensure that your app will be reliable and scalable. Yeah, yeah. and again, it's an investment up front, and you may not mm -hmm. see the payoff right away, but modules are already helping some apps I'm doing at work, and it just the, it makes it makes sense once you get into it. But I admit, the first time I got it, I 
didn't know what was going on. So yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, and and for so when one thing that you might notice tomorrow in the second day of training is actually so we're going to talk about modules, and since we have to talk about small examples, you know, f so that people can follow along, you know, the the example without modules is actually s shorter, takes less code, sure. and uh, and it's easier to understand because it's such a small example, mm -hmm. and then it seems like so contrived to be making these modules for these examples, and and you almost feel like I don't know why I'm doing all the spoiler plate and all of these unnecessary things for something that I already know how to do in one file. Right. And, and it's, it's exactly what you said, you know, the, the investment is up front, you're paying the price, uh, price up front, and you might even feel like this is not worth it. But if that app does grow to be a lot bigger than what it originally is, then you'll definitely be happy that mm -hmm. you were thinking in modules and in reactivity from the start. Very good, very good. And um, one thing that I was thinking about as we were learning some stuff today is, you know, the whole concept of designing your app. And there are many ways to do it. Obviously, Shiny itself comes with the various functions like Fluid Page, you know, Bootstrap Layout, all that. We got Shiny Dashboard to give you that business kind of dashboard looking thing. And then we got HTML. 10 was a huge number step up. Um, do you have any advice as somebody's thinking about designing their app on best practices of frameworks to look at, or is it really dependent on what the app's doing? I think it's pretty dependent on what the app's doing. I, I guess my advice would be, you know, uh, walk before you can run. Mm -hmm. So if you've never done Shiny before, uh, well, I guess th this can be interpreted in two ways. If you've done a lot of web programming, but you've never done Shiny before, then HTML templates is probably the way to go, right? Because it lets you program in a language you're already comfortable with, and then you just put the reactivity where you need it. But I think that's really the, um, the exception and not the rule here, because most people that start doing Shiny, they really are data scientists and they're statisticians. They're people that don't have this programming and web development background. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for them that have never programmed, that maybe don't really know what HTML looks like, I really think, you know, start with what comes out of the box. Sure. And, and, and make sure that works for you. And even make sure that Shiny uh, is what you want, because it'd be kind of um, a waste of your time to put all of this effort to learn how to make pretty UI in Shiny if then Shiny is not really giving you the capabilities uh, that you need. Um, right, right. So, you know, walk before you can run. Uh, if Unless you already can run because you're a <laughs> web developer. Yeah. And in that case, it makes all the, se all the sense in the world to use, you know, HTML directly and just insert uh, the reactivity where you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, I mean, I do think that uh, Bootstrap has a lot of flexibility. You can include style sheets, uh, you know, so I think you can definitely make a very customized look to your app just uh, by using what's out of the box and then tweaking it. Uh, but I definitely think you should tweak after you kind of understand how things uh, work instead of like the starting with the UI and making sure that looks perfect and then going into the server and not having done that ever before. I think that would be the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one area that I think is growing almost exponentially, even since you know, as of a couple of years ago, is the HTML widget space, mm -hmm. where you can really plug in these very nice dynamic JavaScript widgets that, you know, in my case, somebody else takes the hard work and putting it into an R package. I just plug it in the apps I make, so I don't have to get my hands dirty, so to speak. But then there are other ones that are either newer or they haven't made the connections with Shiny yet. Um, I guess my question on this is, do you see some widgets in the current ecosystem of the HMO widgets land that you think are really starting to take off and that could be really powerful inside a Shiny app? And I think that's probably very dependent on what you're using it for. Um, you know, so so I think one thing that's in, in general growing in the data viz world is maps and spatial um, visualization. So we have Leaflet for that in Shiny, mm -hmm. and I I do think that is growing. Um, I think yeah, I think a lot of the visualization tools are uh, things that people crave more and more. Data viz is kind of. Um, sexy right now. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, whether that's um, yeah, leaflet or uh, D3 with D3 heat map, for example, that's something that I've seen people wanting to use. And unfortunately, something that we haven't actually devoted a lot of resources to. Um, well, actually, Joe has been doing quite a bit on um, on leaflet. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I think there's a variety of things that could grow. But, you know, if you're doing um, web scraping and you're showing the results in a shiny app and you have absolutely no interest in visualization and um 
or maps or spatial uh, visualization of any kind, and it really doesn't make sense for you. So uh, I think it's hard for me to try to see like a couple of widgets that I'm sure will take off. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people do so many different things with uh, Shiny and with R in general that it's hard to extrapolate that way. But you know, if I had to choose one, definitely the uh, visualization stuff, everything that JavaScript has a lot of very cool, nice visualization libraries, right? D3 being one of them. Sure, sure. Uh, so, so I think that's naturally, like we're naturally attracted to that. Um, yeah. So that's why I see, I, I also think we see a lot of, you know, the leaflet and the mm-hmm. D3 things popping up because it's pretty. So mm-hmm. we gravitate toward that. Yeah, it gets the most attention yeah. right away. And then there are other ones that do a lot of complex things, mm-hmm. but just don't quite get And maybe are very list. specified also. So, you know, only a niche of people really uh, are interested in that. And, you know, visualization, everyone can understand and can uh, yeah. be interested in. So. Yep, makes makes perfect sense. So um, I'll just leave it with any other closing thoughts you have that you want to share with our listeners or any advice, oh. general advice about R or Shiny, <laughs> anything like that that you want to share? You got me off guard. I uh, know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, don't really, I, I don't really have anything off the top of my head. Um, or where, where could people follow you to keep up with your developments, things like that? <sighs> so there's my GitHub account. Um, okay. Uh, there's, I think all of that info is in the R Studio uh, team page sure, or about yeah. us page. Um, I don't really, I, I'm not a very public. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't tweet or anything like a lot of the R Studio folks. <laughs> um, I think I'm much more of an introverted person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do actually want to say something. I think which is like, um, R is so beautiful and amazing, and the. Uh, uh, our community and the open source spirit behind it and you know all of your listeners and all of the people around here really make this a very special place to be and a very sp- special place uh, to you know it's almost my place of work is the R community right every mm-hmm. day I'm reading uh, issues from all over the world or, or uh, you know uh, going on threads on shiny discuss and uh, and you know I'm actually working upon um, things that people in the course of their you know, either their their studies or their work or you know their um, spare time activities. You know, they come across something, they uh, send a bug report or whatever. We see it, and then often we act on it. More often than not, uh, you know, the ideas for us to go forward come from our users. So, I mean, it's a really really special place to be, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. So I just wanted to emphasize that. You know, yep. so it's. I'm very happy we have that. It's R um, has been a, an amazing open source project, and I hope it will continue to be, and that the R community continues to be as vibrant as it is. Um, it's very, very gratifying to work in a, an environment like that. Yeah, I, I've been a fan of open source, not just, of course, in R and data science, but, of course, in the computing space. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I wear my love for Linux on my sleeve, so to speak, on my <laughs> laptop, all that. I think it's a great story and just you know, give me tools to do my job well. And, uh, and the best part is it's all free. So. Exactly. <laughs> and we can, we can all collaborate. That. It's yes. no. all in the open. Yep. It just... It's, it's very, very transparent. Very transparent. Yep. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Yep, yep. Well, I definitely want to thank you very much for sitting down with me for a few minutes. And thank I'm you. looking forward to seeing your next advancements with Shiny and, and in R going forward. So thank you, Barbara. Yeah, thank you, Eric. All right. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our series on our Studio Conf on location. We have just finished the first day of our intermediate shiny training, and I have the pleasure of uh, sitting down with our first ever uh, two-time guest on the R podcast, uh, Dean Atelli, famous for Shiny GS, among many other things. Shiny is, is here with me today, so Dean, thanks for joining me again. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure, just as it was a year ago for the first time. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I, we've had, um, since the last time we talked, you've uh, finished that little thing called graduate school. Yes, I did. Very, very exciting to get past that. So one, since um, R was a big part in my um, graduation or my dissertation research and getting completing all that, 
I'm just curious how R played a role in your research and getting getting that finished. Yeah, so in my research, R was really a very, very, um, very key part because my thesis essentially revolved around building an R package mm -hmm. and then building an associated Shiny app to that R package. And, um, you know, that that's what 90% of my thesis work went into. And then something else that was cool about that is, is uh, because most of my work went into writing an R package in a Shiny app, in my actual thesis, most of my writing was actually focused on, you know, the technical um, details of my package and, 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 and how the Shiny app works and how to use the Shiny app and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, instead of focusing on all the non-fun stuff that people usually do when they write a thesis, <laughs> right, right. I actually enjoyed it because I just got to write about, you know, R wow. and about my development. We so, all can dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I thought it was fair. I loved it. And yeah. It was, cool. I mean, it was mostly thanks to Jenny Bryan because she was my supervisor and, yeah. you know, all her work is in R. So, yep. that's all I did. Very good fit. Yeah, it's very appropriate, too. Um, so another effort that you started since we last talked, um, this is a little more recent, is that uh, you've recently released your first ever HTML widget package uh, called TimeViz, which mm -hmm. is very exciting, very cool. Um, so I'm just curious from your perspective, how was creating that HTML widget and wrapping it into an R package, that overall experience, how did that compare to say your work when in Shiny, like with Shiny JS and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so first of all, I'll just, quickly mention what HTML widgets are because yes, I, don't, I don't know if everybody knows. Uh, HTML widgets are, uh, it's a package and it's a way to bring in JavaScript libraries, specifically JavaScript visualization libraries into Shiny. And now the thing is for the longest time, I didn't actually know how to write HTML widgets because it was, it was a package that existed and I had my own set of packages for Shiny and I didn't really play with the other ones. And the reason I actually got into HTML widgets was uh, because of you, Eric. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's ironic, yeah. That's I don't know if, cool. do, you, do you remember though? Do you remember why? It was Sweet Alert. Exactly. Yep, yeah. GitHub issue with Sweet Alert. Yes. And I, I summoned you, and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I admit I was new to GitHub issues at that time, so I was like, oh, I'm gonna put Dean's name in there because I, I you know. I See, do you remember? Help, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kent, Kent Russell exactly. um, made, made, made an HTML widget called Sweet Alert, and then Eric uh, opened some issue, and he tagged me on it, and he asked me a question about it. Mm -hmm. And my response was, honestly, I'm embarrassed to say, but I don't know HTML widgets. Um, and then, you know, a year almost went by, and then in use R half a year ago, I was talking to Ramnath, who is the author of HTML widgets. Yeah, yeah. And as I was talking to him, you know, he, he you know, he said something about HTML widgets, and again I had to say, Oh my god, I don't you know, I've never actually used it, even though I know it's such a big thing. Yeah. So at that point I, I told myself, Okay, Dean, this is enough you know you have to go home and learn how to use HTML widgets <laughs> so so that's what got me you know trying to do it and then actually building one so uh, you know I was looking for a useful HTML widget to build I didn't want to just build something to learn I wanted to you know make something yeah. useful for the community very cool yep. so that was already hard because so many people have built some and and they're so great all of them yeah. but eventually I found one time viz which is uh, you know visualizing in timeline yeah very nice. Yep. And um, so I went about building it. And what I found was that, for me at least, it was actually more difficult to do that than writing, for example, Shiny.js. And that's for two reasons. So okay. first of all, with Shiny.js, um, I built it you know, all from scratch. So I was free to do kind of whatever I wanted. I didn't have to read any documentation or anything like that. I, yeah. just, I just did my own thing. And I, yep. you know, I had to picture in my mind how to build it. Um, and you know, with TimeViz, because it's an HTML widget, I had to read HTML visit widgets documentation and sure. to see other HTML widgets, how they work, and to kind of mm -hmm. figure out how to do that and mm -hmm. to integrate with their API. So it was a bit more work on that on that part. And second of all, this is gonna sound silly, but um, when I built ChinaJS, that was two years ago, I felt like you know I was just doing it for myself. No one's ever gonna see this. No one's ever gonna see this random package that I put on GitHub. Um, so, you know, I didn't have any pressure kind of thing. And then with, <laughs> with my HTML widget, um, you know, I felt like by that point, people, when, whenever I release a package, people kind of have an expectation. So I can't, I can't put something like really stupid out there <laughs> because then people are going to be like, oh my God, I thought Dean was, you know, not an idiot. And now I see this package and it has all these weird things that he's doing. So yeah, right. because it was my first HTML widget, I was worried that people who have done those before would think that my code was 
silly. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Very cool. Very and, and cool. you know, it's, it actually reminds me of something that Jenny, Jenny Bryan once told me. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if, I hope she's okay with me saying this, but, um, yeah, I was in her office one day and she asked me a question about just like a random art question. And, um, I asked her, why don't you just ask us, ask it on Twitter? And she told me that, you know, Dean, now, you know, now that I have a lot of, you know, high profile art people on my Twitter following me, I can't just ask whatever I want. I have to make sure it's, that what I say is not stupid. You life know? is a little different now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and I just, yeah. So, you know, she can't ask silly art questions because, you know, Hadley follows her. So oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. The game changes when you got Hadley following you. Yeah, that's true. You almost have to make like a dummy Twitter account or something. Yeah. <laughs> Be an imposter or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, very. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful widget, and um, I'll put a, a plug for the post you made on your experience on that too. Because, to me, yeah, the the official documentation is pretty good, but you really went through some practical issues. I think that not other sources really touch much. So, mm -hmm. I, if people ask me, you know, Eric, how do you get started making more widgets? I'm be like, well, first, obviously, look at the Art Studio page on it, but then look at Dean's post because honestly, there's not Thank much you. else out there. So. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm excited about this space. I think it's kind of like the next frontier in terms of interactivity and the fact that the floodgates are kind of open with all these other brilliant people doing JavaScript things that yeah. I would never be able to do in a million years. But as long as people that can tie it up into some kind of R package, then I can use it, whether it's in our Markdown reports or, of course, Shiny apps or anything like that. It's, it's, it, there's, I think there's a lot of untapped potential here. Reminds me a little. Well, infinite almost. I infinite, mean, any any, yeah, any yeah. JavaScript library that exists out there, yeah. you know, can be poured into an HTML widget. Yeah. So I feel like it's kind of like the the new uh, new age version of what R went through earlier on with converting a lot of these C or C plus plus you know routines into R via RCPB something like that. So it's not directly comparable, but yeah. I, I do see like yeah. Well, it's a shiny it's a shiny translation of that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm I'm. I'm really stoked that I can use things like, you know, TimeViz, Plotly, Viz Network, and of course, Sweet Alert, the one I got started <laughs> with. So it's the fact that I can pick and choose these and make my apps just a little bit better for all that. So yeah, so, uh, yeah. so on, on the subject of shiny apps, of course, I think there's one area that I, when I spoke with Joe Chang last year, he even acknowledged as a big problem. It's a, it's a concept of testing an app in some kind of automated fashion that doesn't make it so arduous to a developer to test the UI of it. Mm -hmm. So I've been following things like our Selenium and other efforts like this, but there's a newer one that's come out somewhat recently. Um, it's still in development, I would say. It's called yeah. Shiny Test. Now I've seen you've had some uh, feedback on their issue tracker, it looks like on that. So yeah, I don't I did. know if you had opinions on what Shiny Test's uh, potential could be and kind of your perspective on Shiny Testing in general. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, but how did, how did you hear about Shiny Test? I, I, I mean, it's not <laughs> released or published, published well, in any way. Well, so it's kind of a funny story. You know, um, Gabor is, is the, author, yeah. the original yeah. author of it, and of course he's you know, done some awesome things of our hub right now. Yes, he now, did. So I was... Everything he does is. <laughs> everything does, yeah. So it's like, that's just tip of the iceberg. So I was poking around the GitHub repo and I suddenly came across Shiny Test. I'm like, what oh, is this? So just I, from looking at GitHub? Just looking at GitHub. <laughs> yep. So honestly, with people like, you know, like you and the R Studio people, I just look at your GitHub thing, seeing what you're up to next sometimes. So it really is a social media then. It's like on Facebook, you just, you know, you browse yes. and you end up on like your friend's friend's boyfriend's grandmother's yeah. picture all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah you no, just end it, up on some random yeah, repo. I, I don't know how, how, how it ever happened like that. But yeah, it's like that's the way I follow the key developments is that, uh, you know, our bloggers is good for like published type things that people are ready to talk about. Yeah. But then things are kind of like in the baking oven, so to speak. It seems like GitHub's the best way to do that. So, so that's true. how I found out about it. And I was like, okay, that's a huge, that's a huge want on my list. So yeah, I was just curious what your perspective is on, on Shiny Test. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing package that's, that's going to exist when it's ready. Um, when it's ready. Yeah, yep. it's still yep. in development. <laughs> yep, yep. It may not be production ready yet, so. <laughs> not yet, but. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, it's definitely in, in need that Shiny people have had for a long time because yeah. I know I've talked to Joe and the Shiny team a few times about, you know, how do we test this stuff? And I've seen a lot of people ask the same question. Yeah. And um, as you mentioned, Gabor um, from Mango Solutions um, started this package. Mm -hmm. 
And I only know about it because he reached out to me a few, I think it was in September, four months ago. Um, he just asked me, you know, he, he told me, here's a package I built for unit testing in Shiny. What do you think? Do you have any feedback? So I just, um, we just had a bunch of long email threads, you know, discussing what it should do and, and you know, what it currently does and, and where it should go. So I just had mainly feedback about it. I don't have, you know, I, I contributed zero to the actual development of it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Would have been cool to say that I'm part of it, <laughs> but I'm not really. I'm more. Well, but you've looked at it though. I've looked at we, it. Yeah. We, we always like people that know Shiny very well to keep an eye on these things to make sure yeah. things are on track. So, so yeah. and I did help him realize that it was on Windows. It was extremely slow. It was about 20 times slower on Windows than on um, Linux or Mac. Wow. Um, I didn't. I mean, I didn't know why. I just told him. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and then Gabor, right. being the brilliant, brilliant man he is, he he figured out why exactly and he fixed that. Wow. Kudos but, um, I don't even know where to look there. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think now uh, I think now it's been passed on to our studio. So I think now Winston is the main developer of it. Oh, okay. So it's actually cool. going to be developed by our studio now. So it's going to be an official studio package, wow. and it's going to be very very good when it when it comes out. Um, wow. There's a few things I'm still not quite sure how it's going to do. Oh, like like what? Because because you know UI testing is you know it's hard. Anywhere, not just in R or Shiny. It's just oh, it's, yeah. it's it's known to be a hard problem how to yeah. do UI testing. Right, right. Um, so things like you know how to test that the UI actually looks the way it's supposed to. You know to mm. make sure that things are in the place they're supposed to be in the the right color and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't. I can't think of a way to do that properly. Yeah, good point. Right. Or mm -hmm. or or testing interactive visualizations. Right, like. Moving your mouse over, you know, the bar in an interactive bar chart, and making sure that you see the hover, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know if it could do. Yeah. But but point. it's definitely um, shiny test is definitely a package that's going to make it at least. Uh, it's it's a great starting point for for testing your shiny yeah, apps. Yeah. Because honestly, we really have not much. Well, else yeah, right we now. have we have <laughs> nothing right now. Yeah. I mean. I I I mean, the closest thing we have is our selenium, and I tried using it. And I got kind of halfway through but then when your app has a complex thing like a data table from dt or any of these other widgets it's like yeah it, you got nothing there so we'll see what happens like yeah, you said there's, there's yeah. some issues to consider Sh shiny test has a lot of promise though yeah yes. I'm, I'm yeah once it's once it's on crown i'm going to be adding it into all my package all my shiny packages you bet you yeah. bet because it can automate you know if it automates just half of my overall testing that's a half that i'm glad to automate later yeah on, and, so. and the big thing and also about <laughs> shiny shiny apps is that regression testing is really important because in shiny apps it's really easy to you know introduce a new input mm -hmm. and all of a sudden something else breaks that you don't even think about testing because with shiny how do you test you just have to open the app and click on things right so you don't right. think about doing that every single time you do something new you don't think about all the different click combinations yes so yes. shiny sh shiny testing is going to be great for that for yeah. regression testing yeah so another one of these promising efforts uh, we're definitely going to keep an eye on um so continuing our our discussion on the shiny side of things so on your on your site, which is of course an awesome site, by the way, of your articles and everything, you have uh, <laughs> mentioned that you are now a shiny consultant. So that's 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 cool because honestly, a lot of us in shiny always have questions down the road. Uh, I'm just curious what your experience has been like, and you know, providing the consulting to people, and um, have you seen any common trends of key issues that people deal with, you know, across the different apps that people make, anything like that? Yeah. So yes, you're right. My my side does say now that I'm a shiny consultant. <laughs> uh, it actually it actually took me a while to to say that. Uh, initially, I just kind of, you know, accepted people's offers to pay me for for shiny development. And eventually, I said, you know what? Since people keep coming to me, I'll I'll just say that I'm a shiny consultant. Yeah. You know, it just gives it a bit more credibility if I claim that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and honestly, you you're the pioneer in this because outside of our studio themselves, I don't know anybody that's really doing this as a service. So very cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, so it's great, and I've actually I'm, I've been very surprised by the volume, but but by how many people actually reach out and how many people there are out there, people and companies who who are looking for help with Shiny and are willing to 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 pay for help with Shiny. So mm -hmm. that that's been a very positive experience. Cool. Um, what what I, one if there's a few things I noticed that a lot of people are struggling with because uh, 
one of the things that usually I work with people is a lot of times they share their app code with me. And, you know, sometimes they share code that's like thousands of lines long. Yes. And I um, I never look forward to looking into that because <laughs> I know it's going to, you know, if they have one file with 5,000 lines, you can, you know, assume it's not going to be the greatest code. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a few things. I mean, usually people have problems with reactivity and, and understanding when to make things reactive and when reactive expressions trigger. And um, the, yeah, it's just it's just hard for people to understand the whole reactivity concept. And I think that's fair because it is, I think, the hardest thing about Shiny, mm -hmm. which is also why Joe spends a lot of time trying to really nail that down when he does do workshops in Shiny because it, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult concept. Yep, yep. So those of you listening that are like, oh, reactivity, where can I get more? Honestly, the best place to go is um, on our studio site. They have other videos from last year's Shiny DevCon where Joe went to great lengths about reactivity. And I'm sure there'll be more stuff later on this year that has passed along. But to me, reactivity, yeah. once you get a handle on that, the rest of it somewhat falls in place. But yeah. Yeah, if, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're building Shiny apps and you're looking to go into the next step, the first thing you have to really understand and grasp well is reactivity because yeah. it is a difficult topic. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to to accidentally have your reactive expressions fire off way too many times when you don't expect it to. So it's really something you have to. You, you just it comes with practice, yep. but you also need to know the theory behind it. Yeah, yeah, and it, uh, yeah, I think the way yeah, other than practicing it, it it's pretty abstract in the beginning. Yeah, so it's it's tough. It's tough until you really you know, build some apps that use reactivity and you see right. how it comes into play. Right, right, and it'll solve many issues if you kind of yeah. set that up the right way. Even if it takes you more time in the beginning, I think it, it's worthwhile investment for yeah. sure, yeah, yeah. And, and another thing I noticed a lot of people were not, uh, were struggling with understanding is the scoping rules in Shiny. Oh, so, yes, yes. you know, when they define a variable, whether it's visible to just a single user or to all the users, or only within a reactive expression. Mm -hmm. um, so just that, you know, that global variables versus user variables. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it might not be documented well enough, even though there are articles about it. Maybe they're just not advertised enough. People aren't finding them. People aren't yeah. looking for them. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. But people are not, it's not sinking into most Shiny developers yet. Right, right. And it's, a, it's an easy way to get almost too comfortable using a lot of global things. And then suddenly right. someone goes haywire and you have no idea yeah, why. Yeah, so, so, yeah, exactly. So one thing I've noticed is that a lot of people just um, put all their variables as global variables. And then, you know, when, when they test their apps, you know, locally, they always just have one browser window open and everything works fine. Of course. And then they yeah. give it to other people to use. And if two people are using it at the same time, all of a yep. sudden they're having conflicting values. You know, yep. they're changing each other's values. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, what's going on? Yep. So I, I personally was a victim of You've that. you that. <laughs> earlier apps I did where I had no idea what all this meant. And then suddenly one user was seeing the other user's data and I'm like, oh no, that's exactly <laughs> not what I wanted. So that was that was two or two and a half years ago. Luckily I've, I've wisened up since, but <laughs> sometimes we have to learn this the hard way. So that was one of those lessons. Scoping, yeah, definitely learn more about that yeah. if you have weird issues with multiple users. Yeah, it's sure. important. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so actually that kind of reminds me when we were at Shiny DevCon last year, and of course we're gonna hear about more in the training tomorrow, Obviously, some of the newer features that Shiny has incorporated, such as like modules, and we're going to hear about you know dynamic UIs and stuff. So, of the more newer features that have been introduced recently, what are some of the features that you have seen a lot that for your apps that if you were going to make an app that you'd want to start with or at least use a lot more of? Well, one one of the I think the best feature of the year maybe for for Shiny is the bookmarkable state. <laughs> That's something yes. that a lot of people have asked for. So the ability to um, to save the current state of all your inputs in the Shiny app and be able to just you know rest restore that same app with all your inputs having the exact same value again. Right. That is now built into Shiny, and uh, it's a great feature. I personally haven't used it much myself yet, mm -hmm. but I think it's useful for a lot of people out there. Yeah, so I mean, just the fact that you can give them a URL if you do like the URL version, but then if you're out, if you're fortunate enough to have the server environment to have all that saved somewhere that the user doesn't have to worry about, you just log on again and magically it comes back. That is, for a lot of the apps that have you know more than the typical sidebar layout with like you know two or three inputs inside, 
it's just so time consuming to recreate an analysis you did the day before and you only have to change one thing but yeah so it sounds like you know bookmarkable state is, like i said it's been a sorely needed feature and better late than never as i say yeah so, no it's great yeah yeah and then they also recently introduced um dialogues um like modals yeah and yes. i mean that's also something that a lot of people have wanted to do for a long time so mm -hmm. it's just a really easy way to just give the user a message yep that he can dismiss you know it's super useful yeah because before you had to do some custom javascript to get that baked in and now it's a, a well, simple function so. shiny js has like a function for it but oh, there you <laughs> it's, go. it's yeah, not as pretty yeah, the yeah. models by, by by shiny are are nicer <laughs> yeah well i mean again just something that the user can see right away and the fact that you can tell make them explicitly click like an okay button or a close button that they have to read the stuff first so that that's nice to have that that kind of control. Yeah, what's your take, and not just on the modes, but like this uh, notification system, they kind of unified the messaging, like the progress bar and the, you know, notification API. Do you use that very much in your apps or is it more so stuff? I actually don't use the, the, the notification progress bar very much. Okay. Um, mostly because I like to make all my apps very, 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 very customized. So, you know, I also, I have never used a, uh, a, lay, a sidebar layout, for example. Oh, you know, sure, other yeah. than when I when I was just first doing the tutorial, I've never used it since then because yeah. I, you know, I have my own CSS, my own layout. I make everything exactly the way I want it to. Right, right. Okay. So with progress bars and notifications and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I put my own notification messages exactly where I want them to be and for the length that I want them to be. And if there's a progress bar, then I, you know, I, I make my own icon for progress and I tell it where to go mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. But I mean, for anyone else who, who doesn't want to put the time that I put into it every time, I think it's extremely useful. It's a yeah. very good way to do it easily and quickly. Yeah, especially for long running processes, just yeah. to make sure they know something's happening. Yeah. And then they don't close it like in 10 seconds so they don't see something happen and they complain to you like, oh, your app's broken. Well, well yeah, it's not broken, that, it just takes some time, right? <laughs> that, that's a very important thing. And not just in R Shiny, just, you know, in a lot of other, um, you know, web services or really any application, a lot of times you see that you click a button and nothing happens for a second and you wonder is something going on or not so right right whenever you do anything this is for anyone you know if, if ever you're building a, a ui and you're doing something that takes more than you know half a second you should always mm -hmm. give the user feedback that something yep. is thinking yep yep so it doesn't so. matter how you do it just even if you just say please wait as long as you give a message and make yeah. it make sure that they know you're working on it yeah, exactly. So just that that little investment you can make is, is going to be great for the user experience yeah. for sure. Yeah, huge user yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. So um, one like, last question before we wrap up. Um, I have two more actually. <laughs> um, the first one, I mean, we we touched on widgets before and how that yeah that po the possibility of baking these in is really growing exponentially, so to speak. Um, I know one promising effort is how you can get a widget to talk to Shiny, so to speak. So the Shiny's aware of when the user manipulates something. And, and one of the widgets I've been keeping an eye on is Plotly, which has gotten a lot of attention lately. Very great interactive visualization tool. Um, but it looks like there's this newer effort called Crosstalk mm -hmm. to help tie all that stuff together. So do you have any perspectives on kind of on that effort or have you used yeah, that much? Yeah, Crosstalk is, is, is an amazing new package. Uh, Wait, were you at UseR? Earlier I, this I year, wasn't. Year? I watched the no. videos. Yeah. So I, I think that's where they initially, um, when they initially released um, Crosstalk, or when, when yeah. Joe, or it might, it might have been someone else from our studio who initially um, said that Crosstalk is now a package, and they they showed everyone how it works, and everybody there was just like, "Wow, this is such an amazing thing that Chinese can now do." So what right. it what it does is, um, there's a lot of different HTML widgets out there in Shiny, and up until now every HTML widget was always independent. You know, when, when you when you interact with one HTML widget, you know, the data and everything changes within that widget, mm -hmm. but none of the other widgets around it, um, you know, have any changes corresponding to that. Mm -hmm. So Crosstalk is now a way for different HTML widgets to talk to each other. So when you, you know, let's say you filter data in one widget, a different widget can also have that same data filtered. Or if you, let's say you have a plot and you select some points on a plot, a different widget that uses the same data can all of a sudden now only show data for the plots, for the points that you selected on that plot. So it's really a great initiative by our studio. Yeah. And um, there's not too many widgets yet that use it because it's still in the, I mean, I would still say it's in development because mm -hmm. um, 
they're still kind of trying to think about what the best API is for that. Yeah, right, right. And it's it's only half a year old. I don't even know if it's on CRAN yet. I don't believe it is. Yeah, I just I remember yeah the the use our talk and I was like I gotta keep my eye on this because for all of us making more complex apps, we definitely have more than one widget in yeah. there. And they're maybe using the same underlying data, but just in much different ways. No matter if it's like drawing a network diagram and then maybe filtering on what that one node represents and some other metadata, things like that. It would be so cool to just be able to tie that all together. With exactly. What clicking on, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So it's the data that's being shared among all the different widgets. Yeah. That, that's what I, I didn't mention before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's 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 a, I, I think, like you said, they're they're taking their time with the API of it because they're trying to think of the best way to do best it. Way to yeah, do it. yeah. So is that you know, once you commit to something, it's it's there for good. Sometimes, <laughs> just like uh, Joe's choice on the whole observe versus reactive naming mm -hmm. scheme and all that. But you know, yeah, and, and now he has some regrets. <laughs> he does have some regrets. So I mean, you know, but the fact that it exists, it's already good enough for me. But you yeah. know, you know, when when you're striking for perfection, it's always <laughs> or easy he, to think of those things. He was <laughs> mentioning today how I. Um, uh, how about uh, the data table, how he yes. regrets naming the data table function in Shiny the same as the DD, data t DD, yep. DT colon colon data table, exactly, yep, and how yep. having that name being the same both in Shiny and in DT is kind of a bad yeah. choice. Yeah, but that's caused a bit of problems. That's what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so last question is more of a fun one um, because at least at the time we're recording this, um, CRAN is soon to hit 10,000 packages. It's a huge milestone. We should, again, say thanks to everybody that's contributed packages and of course to the R core team for having this mechanism but everybody's trying to predict when it will happen that i mean that that's cool and all. yeah i've, I've seen, well, posts about seen posts about that what i'm trying to ask people at the conference just for fun is what type of package do you think it will be i have my thoughts but if you have any general guesses so, what type so of did, package you, did you get some be? answers did you ask some people yeah i've asked a few people yeah? yep i'll <laughs> let you answer first before i reveal what i've heard so far <laughs> uh See, I mean, my background is not in stats, so I'm not a very good like predicting person. <laughs> I mean, well, if, if I had even to... statisticians aren't good at predicting, that's, that's why we true. have have air. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean, what I would do is I would, I would, you know, build a package that would do some kind of machine learning to try to look at all the different patterns of, yeah. you know look at all the titles of the packages that have been released and what days were they released on and yeah. what dates of the year and try to see if there's like, you know, in January, middle of January, some, you know, <laughs> mostly shiny packages came out or mostly yeah. <laughs> text packages. Yeah, so if you're listening to this, that sounds like a great analysis to do, by the way, any wink, wink, okay. <laughs> so yeah. I'll tell you what I've heard so far is, yeah. um, I've heard a mix of some kind of API, like web API package. There's a lot, you know, a lot of companies or, or services are releasing data for an API, of course. So a lot of people in the R community are trying to make packages that talk to those APIs using, you know, um, like the uh, Hadley's recent packages on R, what's it called? Well, RVEST is for scraping mm -hmm. web data, but there's another one that... HTTR? HTTR, that's yeah. one, yeah. So a lot of people are making packages on that. Others think it will be some kind of stat, you know, machine learning and predicting type thing. Others say it will be like a shiny gadget type thing, perhaps, you know? Unfortunately, it, I, I feel like there's not as many gadgets and add-ins as, as, as I thought there would be. I don't think it's picking yeah. up as much as, as it could. Yeah, yeah. We got a more, uh, more uh, how should we say, maybe a biased sample here of people that really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone here knows about it and loves it. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my hunch is going to be some kind of API thing just because that's API. really taking off to getting data into our especially in some of the recent events of the past few months where people want to scrape data for... <laughs> Lots can, of data to in, scrape. You can you can fill in the blanks there. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Lots of different scandals or whatever you want yeah, to look there's, at. There's all sorts Lots of stuff of data there. Out there. So, yeah. so we'll see what happens. It's still a big milestone. Um, well, so Dean, it's been great talking to you. Any, um, anything else you want to share with the audience before we sign off? Um, no, not really. I'm, I'm just really looking forward for this entire week. I mean, we're yeah. here at the Gaylord Palm Resort in Orlando yeah. for our studio's first annual conference. Yeah. And it's an amazing place. Yes. Uh, it's an amazing, it's been an amazing first day of a conference so far, and I'm very excited to see what's coming up for the next three days. Me too, me too. And um, I believe, uh, what would be the best ways that our audience can follow your efforts right now? I would say, you know, either follow me on Twitter or mm -hmm. just you know go to my website dinatali.com um, you know when when you asked me this a year ago I said, I said just check my website every few months but yeah. now I actually have a little some would say annoying 
message that's <laughs> like, hey, want to join my mailing list? So <laughs> that's that's a new effort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, feel free to join my mailing list if you want to know about updates. Very good. But yep. That's still a, that's a very. I'm trying not to push that too hard. <laughs> no, you know, well, you know, in moderation as always. Yep, yeah. Yep. But. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep doing that. But yeah, thanks again for talking with me. And Thank um, you, Eric. we'll definitely whoop again soon. So. Yeah. All right, everyone. We'll be back right after this. All right, we are back, and I want to thank again uh, Barbara and Dean for sitting down with me and the, being so gracious of their time to talk with me for those two really good interviews. You can definitely sense just how much how much uh, excitement they have with Shiny and the doors that it's opening, and, just, and frankly, just how smart they are. I mean, I only wish I was half as smart as they were with some of the web technology stacks and, and how Shiny plays in that, but you know, they're they're really good people to talk to, so I hope you really enjoyed uh, hearing their perspectives on, on these things. So, this episode will be a, a little different than the others. I'm not going to do a, a news roundup like I, I used to, although I will mention that there's since our last episode, there's been a great new uh, site that's appeared called our weekly our weekly.org i believe is the domain and basically every monday morning i believe they have basically a roundup of the big news items some happenings around the community you know some package developments and they even have a section on media i.e podcasts and stuff so hopefully i get have a entry there down the road but um I was going to say that you may want to add that to your like RSS feed catcher or just make a note to check that site out. So from time to time, I'll probably reference maybe similar stories as they do. But if, if I don't cover a news item for a particular episode, you'll definitely want to check that site out and you'll definitely uh, see some good stuff there. Um, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> use our, this last segment to do one of my favorite parts is our package pick. Okay, so um, one thing that I've been encountering with the applications I'm developing with Shiny is they have definitely increased in complexity, which is kind of out of necessity for some of the stuff they're doing, which means there's a lot of places to navigate for the user, lots of different inputs, different tabs to go into, you know, just sometimes they can get a little, how shall I say, they're a little intimidated by all the stuff that they can control and sometimes they just need a kind of a helping hand or a guide to walk them through an application for the first time and get a feel for what are the key things that they need to control what can they expect to see so in the past I would you know try and kind of bake in various ways of showing you know documentation within the app um, one approach is to like put say a button or a link in your app that either pops up some kind of window or maybe has an external link to another site where you have more information on the app. And I think there's definitely still a place for that. But uh, last year at Shiny DevCon, uh, Herman Sontrap was one of the invited speakers and he gave this, you know, I may mention in the last episode, this really mesmerizing kind of talk on how he, you know, he integrated a lot of different widgets and JavaScript into a really attractive UI for Shiny. And we, a lot of us were just like, wow, we had no idea you could do all this. And he makes it sound so easy and he's smart. For him it is. For some of us, we're still trying to learn the ropes on this. Well, one of those widgets that he had <clears throat> used in his um, app demonstration at, at that present, at, at his talk, was um, a way for, for people to look at or kind of highlight certain elements in a web page and then put some kind of help text around it. 
So I learned that this framework was called IntroJS. And sure enough, so, uh, a member of the R community, uh, Carl Gans, I hope I'm saying his name right, he has written an R package called R Intro JS that wraps this Intro JS library so that we can use it in shiny applications via the typical HTML widget framework. Um, so when I was developing a, a relatively bigger app at work and I was starting to get very complex, I was going to go back to my old method of the help system that I did in a, a while back. But then when I saw our intro JS on, on GitHub, I was thinking to myself, well, this is what I've been looking for. So sure enough, it, it works pretty darn well. I mean, it, it takes a little getting used to, but um, Carl's done a good job with uh, documentation in the README. Um, so I de and then you can, you know, run an app that kind of demonstrates the, the features of it. And actually, for the application I'm using it with currently, the application is heavily invested in the module framework, which is something we've touched on in, pre in previous episodes, and, and we'll probably hear more about that as we go along. Um, but I was noticing some weird issues when trying to use this uh, library in, in a module modularized app. And so I filed an issue on, uh, car on the rintro.js GitHub repository because I wanted to see if it was just me not using it right. So luckily, um, Carl was very responsive. He was very comprehensive with um, figuring out what the issue was, and he made a very quick patch on that. It was an issue with environment, so it kind of comes back to what Dean was saying. We have to be you know, pretty careful on how we do you know, scoping and environments within uh, parts of Shiny and then modules just kind of adds another layer on top of that. So he, uh, so Carl fixed the issue. I, uh, I installed the, the updated version in my app's uh, Packrat repository and sure enough, it, everything worked fine in modules after that. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a newer package, so I probably haven't put it through all the paces yet. But I got excellent feedback from a group of users that just saw it for the first time and they were pretty amazed, kind of like what I was last year when I saw that framework. So I'm probably going to use this um, rintro.js package and probably the majority of my apps in the future if they involve more than one, well, I would just maybe say more than five inputs or they have multiple tabs and things like that. So I think. I think there's a lot of potential here to give the user experience just another bit, a bump up in, in improvement by giving them a way to let them navigate the help, or the help documentation that you put together for an application. So again, my package pick for this episode is rintro.js, and we'll have the link to the repository um, in the show notes. So that's going to wrap up this episode of the R podcast. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, the, the best place to go for um, the episodes um, is uh, www.r-podcast.org. Um, you, obviously, you can subscribe to our um, feeds um, for the episodes in your favorite uh, podcasting software. All the information is on the site. Uh, and, um, if you want to send some feedback for the episode or just for the show in general, you can either uh, drop me an email at uh, drcast at gmail.com. You can also make a comment on this um, on the uh, the web page for this particular episode. And then um, there's also a, a contact form on the site. So you can just go click the contact link at the top and then fill out the very simple form. And then I'll get uh, your feedback directly uh, delivered. So again, thanks for tuning in. Um, and until next time. End of line.